Welcome to Learning Unlocked. I am your host, Britt Bingold. As an instructional specialist in Gilbert, Arizona, I am a total nerd when it comes to classroom strategies and educational pedagogy. Educators are the key holders to unlocking learning for students. Today, as always, my goal is to provide you with resources and tools, the keys, to enable and accelerate learning for all students. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. Before we get going on the interview today, I just wanted to do a quick reminder that if you have time to rate us and write us a review on Apple Podcasts, we would appreciate it. The more reviews and ratings we get, the more educators will see our podcast. So if you like what you're hearing and you think others would too, please head over and provide us a review. Thanks. Hey, key holders, welcome to episode 18 of Learning Unlocked. Today, my guest is easily in the top five of the most brilliant people I know. And not only that, but I get to work alongside her and I have for many years and I get to call her one of my best friends. Um, Julia Salsi is in her 17th year in education, 14 of which were in the classroom. She has been an AP teacher, a department chair, a curriculum coordinator, and now she serves as a professional growth instructional specialist. She truly enjoys supporting teachers K through 12 with instructional strategies, um, and not just in a particular content or grade level. I mean, really K through 12, um, building up teachers' toolboxes to help kids. On today's episode, we are discussing homework, which is a heavily debated topic in education. Both of us have done a lot of research on the benefits and challenges of homework. And as both educators and parents, we have come to a consensus. Homework needs a serious revamp. So we've got some ideas and we want to share them with you during this podcast. So here is my interview with Julia. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Julia, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for coming back for season two. I'm really excited to talk to you today about homework. I am too. It's one of the topics that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, and it's a class we teach together, um, and it's a really it's a really good class. I feel like we have really good discussions in it, and so I we really felt the need that it should be a podcast topic since it's been such a popular class. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to first start off by asking you, since I didn't ask you last season, how did you end up in the education field? Like, what's your journey and your story of how you got here today as an instructional specialist? Oh, goodness. It's kind of an interesting story, actually. Um, When I graduated from high school, I was just absolutely positive that I wanted to become a doctor. I actually even had a medical scholarship um, to go to the University of Arizona at the time. And I was in my second year, I believe, um, of college when it just hit me. I was in a science class and I was looking around and I just realized this is not what I want to do. I have no passion or love for this at all. Um, And so I actually even let the scholarship go because it required me, obviously, a medical scholarship to continue on in um, the medical field. So I kind of floundered for a little bit. Um, I graduated with a degree in English. Um, and then landed uh, a job in the summer after I graduated and teaching remedial classes at a community college, remedial English classes. And I can tell you from the first planning session to the first day in front of students, I just fell in love with teaching. Um, I didn't care what I was teaching. Uh, I just loved the planning and creating of activities and the creating of experiences and just seeing them grow and learn. And so it's from there that I ended up um, pursuing my, my teaching credentials. Um, so that really took me into a job in, in high school, teach, teaching, teaching in a high school. And um, from there, I just continued to grow into department chair position and then a content area coordinator. And then ultimately, I landed my, what I consider my dream job. I landed here um, as an instructional specialist because even as I taught English, Uh, 
I knew that I wasn't as passionate about English as I was about the art and science of teaching, um, which I think is awesome now that I get to live in the world um, of the art and science of teaching. Absolutely. I think I totally um, are so similar on that um, because I feel like I, I didn't necessarily love teaching English as well. I mean, it was what I was good at. So like, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I just was like, well, what do I teach? Well, I'm good at English, so we'll go with that. But in the end of the day, it was, I loved watching the spark of um, seeing those kids' eyes light up when they got a new concept or they felt confident in something um, because of how, what I had de developed. I think that's both of our kind of passions there. Um, and we both are moms of two young children and we both do this position. So um, tell me a little bit about um, what you do outside of the classroom, outside of um, do this position in your life. What are your passions? Oh, goodness. Well, um, I am a mom, just as you said, of, of two young children. I have a nine-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. And they pretty much, anybody who has young children can um, attest to this, they pretty much consume every other waking minute that I have when I am not at work. So um, like right now we're in softball season and my daughter's playing softball. Um, my three-year-old is into everything and he loves when mama gets home and just sits down and does puzzles with him or other things like that. So really I'm just busy in mom life and I love mom life. Um, so I, I wouldn't change a thing, but that really hasn't allowed me to pursue a lot of any other personal passions. They are my passion right now. But you also have become quite the crocheter. That is, is that true. A word? That is true. I forget about that. It's so new. Um, yeah, you know, my mom had tried to teach me to crochet for years and I just like, whatever, mom, I don't want to do another granny square. Yeah. But I discovered we made, we started making pumpkins for, um, Halloween and Thanksgiving and I loved it. And I started, um, using Pinterest to pursue and look for more modern crochet stuff. And I am, yeah, I'm pretty much addicted to that. If I buy one more skein of yarn, my husband's going to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna lose it because there's there's balls of yarn all over my house. But I love that because that's how you can release some of your stress from kids and from this position is through that creative expression um, that you just found recently. So I think that's really important for all teachers to recognize as well that they need an outlet. Um, and sometimes an outlet is dancing and laughing, but other times it's doing something creative like woodworking or, or crocheting. So. Um, I think that's important that you have time to do that. And we're going to talk more about having time to do things you love today, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I want to go into um, our next question, which is, let's just get into it. We know their homework has been a large debate and we know the research is in. Um, honestly, the research is in that most kids don't really need homework to, um, it doesn't move them super forward, um, even less so in elementary than in high school. But yet, for some reason, it is just heavily dependent upon in um, education everywhere. Um, so why do you feel that is? Why do you feel like we just have homework in general? And why is it just such a large debate um, still, even in this um, modern century, even through COVID? Yeah, you know, I think in order to really understand homework and understand why it is such a contested topic, um, we really have to think about that homework is not just an isolated thing. Homework is part of a bigger teaching and learning culture. And so it really steps back into how are you teaching students? Um, and in what ways are they learning? In what ways are they demonstrating their learning when they're in the classroom with you? Um, when you have classroom environments that are um, the teacher models, the student practices, the teacher and student grade it together. The teacher models, the student practices, the teacher and student grade the work. Um, if you have a pattern like that of teaching, which in all honesty, we, we see this all the time. Um, a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot. Then this type of culture can lend itself more easily to homework because it becomes, oh, you need to practice again. You need to practice again. And so the real, really, there's two reasons um, that I've discovered that teachers give homework most of the time when we ask the teachers who are just, they're like, no, they have to have it. And that is that 
Um, they are first thinking the kids just need more practice. Or I hear a lot, well, I just, I don't give homework regularly. It's just whatever we don't finish in class and a lesson they have to do at home. Right. Um, and so I think that right there points to a larger kind of instructional culture shift that, that needs to happen. Um, the reality is that when homework is given purposely, which I'll address later, um, as something that students can truly do on their own, um, when it involves imagination or reflection, and it's a manageable amount for a manageable amount of time, it can have a positive effect on learning. Unfortunately, you really have to make sure that all these things are um, in play together, that, that it's not too much time or it's not um, overwhelming at home or it's not just homework for homework's sake. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most important thing that we need to remember as educators is that we want to support the student in his or her home environment. We need to think um, how homework can help us achieve our learning goals, but also how it can support positive relationships in the home. I think any listeners right now who have kids can probably recall a, a pretty negative homework experience and might probably discover <laughs> if they thought about all of them that their homework experiences with their kids in general are probably more negative than positive. Well, even for themselves. Yeah, you know, taking taking school home, which is really what homework does, we're, we're continuing this school day into the home environment. Um, it, starts, it inserts itself into that family dynamic, um, whatever that might be. And because of this, teachers really have to look at homework's impact on that family dynamic. And really, I think it comes down to a couple of things. First, we can't assume that there's someone there to help with homework. Okay? Or even to prompt the kids to do their homework. And I think that's critical. So I have a nine-year-old and we have a routine now. I've set up a routine so she knows as soon as she gets home, she has to sit down, um, grab a quick snack and start on her homework. She's not allowed to do anything else. Um, but if kids don't have someone at home who's, who's set up that routine or who prompt them to do the homework, we can't assume that the kids have those executive functioning skills to prompt themselves to do it. Um, and so yeah, they're kids. So that, that's something that needs to be taught. Right, right. Um, so that's, that's the first piece. Second, we have to understand that even if there is someone home to support it, it is school work, which means that the family is going to sacrifice their home time for this additional schooling. I, I really think that's critical. And I, and I will be honest, I wasn't as passionate about homework until I became a parent. And then as a working parent, my time with my kids in the evening is precious. And I really do resent anything that takes that time away from, from me, where I don't get to choose what's happening in my family anymore because the homework is inserting itself into such a large chunk of the evening. Even if it's only 30 minutes to an hour, I only have about three waking hours with my kids when I go home, and some of that's dinner time, to be together as a family. So, you know, it's actually really called me to question, at what point did we decide that it was okay to insert ourselves as schools into the home environment? And then how do we begin to kind of set criteria for ourselves for when that might be okay? Gosh, I think that is a whole, we could do a whole other podcast on just that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think true. it's such an important question. I mean, when did we decide that that was a necessary and okay thing? I mean, um, and I would love to research that more because I'm sure that that came about for some purpose or for some historical event or reason. Um, but why have we held on to it for so long is really the question, right? Um, and we've talked a lot about, um, you know, a lot of times parents don't know what's going on in the classroom unless they see homework. Or, so there's a lot of reasons why homework, I think, still floats around. Um, but we both have agreed that just because you didn't finish something in class, and, and we've both done this. We're not saying we haven't done this because I've been like, oh, we didn't finish chapter five. So we just finished that up tonight and we'll go over it to the next day. Yeah, I am we've definitely guilty of that. Yeah, it's not like we've never done any of these, like maybe homework flops or whatever. But I think... Um, there's definitely been an instructional problem. I mean, there's an issue there with maybe timing or planning or um, because, you know, a lot of those kids aren't going to go home 
and read it. Maybe they can't read it. They're not having a parent, like you said, prompt them to read it. And so you're kind of expecting a lot is writing on your next lesson of these kids doing this. And then if they don't, we get mad, we get upset. We're like, oh, these kids. But there's so many circumstances going on at home that we don't understand um, as well. So yeah, there's that kind of debate of just maybe we need to to look at our instruction a little bit differently. So, okay, so with that being said, it is beneficial though, in some ways. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so I, the idea here is not to throw homework out. I think it's just to reevaluate what we're giving and how we're having them do it. I also think just in listening to your description of the teacher side of being frustrated when the students don't do their homework, and it's a guarantee. If you send something home, there will be students back the next day that do not have it done for any number of reasons. Um, homework just has this big negative cloud around it for everyone involved. So how do we how do we remove that negative cloud and turn it into something that really is truly beneficial for student learning? Yeah, so for I, sure. I, I have developed what I call the, the PASS, the PASS test. So P-A-S-S. -S. Um, does your homework pass the test? So the P stands for purpose. We really need to consider what is the purpose of the homework? Is it assigned based on what they weren't able to get to in a particular lesson that day? Um, that's not valid because if you didn't finish a lesson as a teacher for any number of reasons, you shouldn't assign homework as kind of the parent and student's responsibility to finish up a lesson that you couldn't finish. So as teachers, we have to own and accept that sometimes we don't get through our lessons but that doesn't become a valid reason to send the remainder of the lesson home with students. And I, yeah. that's just logical to me, but I think also we wanna think about as teachers, if we're teaching a lesson, they, they need teaching or they need a guide on the side that knows exactly what they're doing. And if we send the remainder of a lesson home and it's all new stuff, there's a guarantee that kids will practice it incorrectly, even if just a handful of them, and you have to backtrack the next day. So it really works more against us in, in that format. Um, the other thing that I hear, I hear a lot like, well, they had time to do their homework um, and they were too chatty or there was this issue or I don't know, he had 30 minutes at the end of the day, they could finish all their homework and he just didn't get it done. And when I hear that, I get it. I totally get it. Like sometimes there's those students that just won't stop talking and they never get anything done and that's their kind of natural consequence. And that's okay. As long as you can justify that you're not using it as a punishment for students that have slower processing, students with ADHD, or some other reason beyond the student's control that just makes them slower at work. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's the issue with just saying, well, they had time to finish it. And if they didn't finish it, they had to finish it at home. That's okay, except that there are a lot of reasons that students don't get things done. And that's been kind of I think if a teacher is giving 30 minutes of their class time to do homework, that's right. another issue. Absolutely. I mean, so you're, yeah, we hear that a lot that teachers say, well, we gave, I, you know, I taught the lesson. We, you know, it's the I do, we do, you do but too much, right? So we see that all the time where the teacher teaches it, then maybe they did it together with a partner and then now the rest of the class period is do your homework. If a kid, the kid, any kid is gonna try to not get out of that, they wanna talk with their friends in class. Like, you know what I'm saying? So like it really, use your instructional time to instruct and then you won't need the homework. Yeah, I think that's really important that we maximize that first level of instruction with students. We use minute to minute um, to really, focus in and to formatively assess as we're listening to them talk through content or look at new mm -hmm. things that really if we're doing that that level one our first time instruction with students on a concept or skill if we're doing that really well we don't need to send it home and there's a danger in sending it home that it might actually work against us so when we come to the p the p stands for purpose and i really have suggest considering three valid purposes is it repetition of previously learned content? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but are you, did you realize that students are going to forget important concepts 
um, if they don't continue to practice them. And so you've set up practice of stuff that you can guarantee they've already mastered that you just want that repeated exposure to something from a month ago or six weeks ago that they need that core skill to stay. And um, then you could potentially use homework as a, as a way to do that. Um, an extension that of an activity or a lesson that you've done. An extension doesn't mean they finish what we didn't get to. Extension means this particular skill set lends itself really nicely to any home environment. I want them to evaluate their back patio or their backyard or some, some aspect and how it connects to what we've just learned. Or I want them to open up their refrigerator and count things um, and, and build a chart and see the relevance of the lesson we've learned at school to a new environment like home. That could be a valid reason for sending homework. And then reflection is the other potential purpose. So I just want kids to reflect on what they've learned, what they know, what they don't know, what they feel like their next steps are, and that helps with that suggestion process. So I think the first thing we have to make sure is we know the purpose of the homework and we know that it's a valid purpose. Yeah. And if your purpose can't fit into those categories, then it needs to not be. Yeah, I mean, there's that. There's a good, a good chance of that. That if you're evaluating your homework and it doesn't fit in those three things, that maybe it's not the best thing to send as homework. Um, okay. The second yeah. letter for pass is A, and that's the amount of time. And this one is so big for me. Um, you really have to think about how much time the homework will take. So this is where I, I need all teachers who give homework to hear me because as a parent, this is really big. Um, what you give as homework, if you look at it and say, this is 10 minutes, I know my students, I know their skills, this is going to take 10 minutes. When you say 10 minutes and you send it home at the end of a day, when kids have worked in school all day, when they're in a completely different environment with a whole new set of distractions, you have to recognize that that 10 minutes could very likely be 30 for a lot of your students. So if you send home like three 10 minute things, you're like 30 minutes max tonight, tonight, guys, you could be looking at an hour and a half to two hours for those kids in their home environment um, with their focusing abilities at that time of day. So you really have to remember the amount of time. And so if you say this takes them 10 minutes, I recommend that you triple it. So 10 minutes if they're at their peak is yes, but when they're at home, it's probably 30. And so if you keep that amount of time, um, you know, at the forefront of, of your homework and what you're sending home, you're going to have, I think, a lot more success with what you do actually send home, if anything at all. So I just, that is super important that all teachers hear me on this, that we have to really consider the amount of time. And you really have to think about, okay, if the kid has working parents um, and, or, or not, they get, they get home each day, let's say around 4, 4.30, depending on, you know, start and end times of the school day. Um, maybe mom and dad pick them up, or maybe they get home and then it's 5, 5.30 before mom and dad get there. And it's really bed by 8, 8.30. There's not a lot of time. That's what we call um, the really difficult hours at home as parents, because that's when meltdowns start to happen. Like we know this with toddlers. We know the hour before dinner is just a hot mess. This is when they're hungry, they're tired, have to figure out things that will keep them engaged and entertained. Um, it's no different for our school age kids when they go home. That hour before dinner, they are cranky, they are tired, they are trying to process what they're supposed to do, whether they have really good executive functioning skills or not is going to also connect to how they do. So the amount of time is critical. They need some processing time too. I mean, the school age kids need to be able to come home and, and not go right back into, I mean, I don't want to work all day and go right back home and open my laptop and, and continue working. I want to spend time with my family. So if we're thinking about a kid going through an eight hour school day, They've done their work. They've put in their time. They 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 have a they yeah. Have a you know, break. I was at a conference once. You and I were there together, and one of the presenters he talked about homework um, in light with the analogy of a, the Thanksgiving meal. And so, yeah. you know, he said 
we all have Thanksgiving and we, we, well, we all eat on Thanksgiving and when someone eats a, the Thanksgiving meal, typically they're, they're kind of shoving food in all their favorite foods, right? They're shoving in the potatoes and the turkey and everything that's on their table. You know, in my house, we actually eat earlier in the day. We have it as like a, a late lunch for the sheer fact that we want time to digest our food before we get to all those really yummy pies. Homework yeah. is like shoving all of the Thanksgiving meal in, which is what students get during the day. And then taking them home and immediately asking them to shove in more food before they've had a chance to get the meal that's in there farther along its digestive path. So what we really need to do is understand that um, the research shows that the brain learns best when it can process what is what is being learned and it can have time to process what's being learned and it can then I think sort it into the air, the long-term memory area of the brain, but they have to have that processing time. And so as teachers, we actually work against ourselves when we send homework home too much of it, if it doesn't allow them to digest the learning of the day, because then the brain doesn't really get to sort through it and kind of send it to the right location. Um, but it Yeah, we, we joke uh, that we wish our homework for our kids was more of an antacid than yes. uh, pie. And so, and I, that is a really like butchered explanation of how the brain learns. There's much more science to it, uh, but it works that way sure. in the analogy. Yes, homework should be the antacid, the thing that supports the digestion process rather than shoves in more things to be digested. And I think if teachers think of it that way, they'll come up with some really, really cool structures. So the, yeah, the S of the past test, yeah. we said, what's the purpose? What's the amount of time? Um, what support is required is the first S. So when we talk about um, sending stuff home with kids, what support do you have available for them when they get stuck? What strategies and tools have you given them? Um, do they have a resource place to look online if they need help with something and you've modeled it all or there's a short little video re-explaining it? Whatever it is, you have to consider what are they going to do if they get stuck, if they don't understand it? You cannot rely on a parent or family member being able to help them if they're stuck. And so this is really critical. And I think this is part of the reason why we see the, the benefits of homework really small at the primary age. So at K-1-2, the, the effect size is, is pretty, pretty low um, because they can't do much school type stuff on their own. They do need a guide on the side as they're, as they're learning. And if they don't have that guide on the side, they're either going to practice or learn incorrectly, or they're not going to do it at all, and they're going to deal with you being frustrated with them the next day. Or they're going to get upset, or give, it's going to give them some anxiety around even homework in general because they feel like they're just it, the achievement gap is widening for those kids, um, and that's not fair yeah. Either. Not all home environments are created equal. Right? There's some home environments where yeah. you have two parents at home um, that can work with, work with the kids. They know how to work with the kids. Um, and then there's home environments that are chaotic. I'll be honest, my daughter, for a while there, our home was very chaotic in the evenings because we had just gotten home with a young toddler who hadn't seen her all day, who hadn't seen me all day. Um, it was that horrible hour for toddlers when they're just cranky and they cry all the time. And here's my, my poor like seven, eight-year-old at the time trying to do her homework, literally while her brother is just really upset about something. And she's trying to tune that out while she's doing her homework. And so I think we just have to remember that um, we have to provide all the support for students. We cannot expect parents um, or older siblings or other family members to be their support because we can't guarantee for any number of reasons that they're going to be able to do that. And the final thing kind of goes a little bit with what I'm talking about support-wise is the second S is space. So we have what is the purpose, how much time is it going to take, what supports are available, and then finally what space does the does your, do your students have to, to do this work? So um, do, are you creating homework that really requires them to be in a silent space to get it done? probably not going to happen. Um, if you're expecting them to record a flip grid um, and you want it really clean and neat and perfect, you can't expect that because if, if 
your student has one of your students has three or four younger siblings um, running about, they may, may they may be doing all their homework at the kitchen counter, um, and there isn't necessarily a quiet space to go record. So you need to think about what space does your homework require, right? Um, can it feasibly be completed in a distracting space? So if you're sending something home that requires like this super concentration from 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 your student, you're not going to get that. Um, the, the, um, the majority of people have a noisy home. Like just cooking dinner makes noise. Um, other people in the home make noise. Um, there's just a lot of factors that come into play. Dogs barking, other children outside playing. Oh, the dreaded ice cream truck, right? That just throws my whole house off. You hear the jangling of the the song of the ice cream truck and anything we're doing just like blew up. Um, so we have to think about the space. When What we're sending home, can they do it if they're mildly distracted? We need to make sure that the answer to that is yes, because most kids in their home environment will be mildly distracted. So that's, that's the test. Does your homework pass the test? Do you know, does it, is it a valid purpose? Is it a feasible amount of time? Do, are the supports that are needed, are they available to students and have you trained them how to find them? And then finally, what space does your homework require? So if your homework passes that test, then it could be beneficial homework for students. Yeah, and I mean, and so again, we're not here to say never assign homework. We, you know, it's just, and, and we both are just moms of two young kids. So mine are, we're kind of around the same ages. So Julia has a, a nine-year-old daughter, I have an eight-year-old daughter. She's got a three-year-old son, I have a four-year-old son. So they're right around those same ages. And if we are honest and we're just talking as moms, both of us look so forward to any time that there's no homework assigned for that week or that day um, during the, the breaks or the summers because it's just a relief to us as parents, but it's also an opportunity for us to watch our kids just get to be kids. I think we sometimes forget that even if older kids, 11, 12, 13, 14, they're still kids and they need time to be kids. We don't need to have this hustle culture all the time that I think we're trying to like push onto our kids. Like, oh, well in ele you know, elementary, we assign this because in you know, junior high, they're gonna have this, but you know, junior high, we assign this because high school and then high school goes to college. And we've heard that excuse over and over and over again. And it's like, that's not actually true at all because in college you get way more time to do homework and study. Your schedule is way different than it is in a K through, or a K through 12 structure, but I mean, I think I can be honest. I think Julia is too. We would rather not have it at all and just have them have great instruction during the day. And then when they come home, have time to digest that instruction with us and play with us and have dinner together um, and really have those that family time um, that we well, need. I can say that there's a great benefit to kids getting to go home and just digest their learning, share it, reflect on it. Um, but really ultimately getting to just relax um, and, and like you said, be themselves. I think, you know, we all know how our brain function really goes down when we are stressed and constantly having stuff to do and stuff to do that you feel like there's going to be a punishment or you're not going to meet a deadline or that really, our, our ability to process or deal with other emotional things that come up, we just, we hit a wall. I think we need to remember that the whole day of school is a lot for, for kids. And so to go home and push that school another two hours, one to two hours, is it's a lot for kids. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think we've talked yeah. about, and one of the things that we teach in our class is that we say we have homework that passes the test. Um, and if you're gonna give homework, you might consider doing homework in these three structures. And so we first talk about play-based learning. And that's where you take the learning that you want to happen or the skill that you want practiced, and you put it into a natural play scenario for that child's age. So perhaps you're having them um, count things around the house and record that or do some type of math um, practice with that. Um, or you're having them you know, if it's older student, students, you have them look at 
their social media, um, which, you know, I know not all students have that, um, or something on the web or something that they're passionate about, and they find some comment or some post and they do something with that so that they can see the relevance of what they're learning in their natural, you know, quote unquote, play environment. Um, but play-based learning. Yeah, especially teacher, the teenagers love to push back, right? They love to push buttons. And I think sometimes if they find some comment online or some comment on social media, they always want to jump to reply and it's not always a great response. And so I think um, even if a homework is, hey, take a look at a comment, um, but don't respond, but on paper, I want you to write a statement, you know, topic sentence, a, a, your, your evidence of why this person is incorrect or why you disagree, and then justify it. And that's it. They just write like a simple response off to the side um, without having posted it. Not only are they realizing, uh, I probably shouldn't post this because it's not necessary or productive to society, but I'm also able to use my skills in writing and justification and, and gaining evidence um, so I can recognize that in the world around me. And so that's like a really great idea for play for high school. Um, but yeah, I think play for little ones is, is even easier sometimes. They, they really just want um, more tactile stimulation is really what it boils down to. Like what could they use around the house, you know, um, that they would be interested in. I just read an article that said something about like, how can we, you know, take an object like a spatula and have the students, you know, be from a different planet and they're coming back and it's like a dystopian land and they find this spatula and they have to figure out like, why would people in 2021 be using such a archaic device in the kitchen? And they have to like do this, you know, whole historical thing behind what, what was the spatula and how did it come about? Those are the types of play-based, those are gonna activate more creativity in their brain um, than just being, you know, research a historical object. Um, you're, they're still doing a lot of research on an object, it's just now they're like, his, they're historians from the future looking back. And that's just a totally different spin on it for kids. Yeah, well, and I think we also, we talk a lot about props. So things like, that, that you would find, like you said, the spatula, um, things you might you would most likely find in a home cups um, or paper mm -hmm. plates but yeah is... just little things that they that they might have that you can suggest um, they practice their skill with so we do a lot with stacking cups and or moving shuffling things around you could even send play-based learning is where you send home um, in the sandwich bag some game that they need to play on their own um, we want to be careful about requiring that they play a game with someone else because we can again can't guarantee that but if you can gamify what you're sending home it becomes entertainment learning rather than just rote learning. So the second thing that we talk about as a type of homework that, that could be beneficial when sent home is the retrieval based homework and retrieval practice is really huge if you want students to to learn and retain a skill, or some, some amount of knowledge, you can't do the one and done exposure. So a great example of this is spelling words. If you are having the students still memorize spelling and take spelling tests, and you never come back to those words after the test, there's a really high likelihood that if you gave those students those same words again, six to eight weeks later, they'd miss quite a few of them, um, especially if they're kids that aren't natural spellers. So, the retrieval practice is really about what is what are the skills that you want students to master and how do you weave those in as you go throughout the year. So, you know, again, back to the spelling example, not my favorite, but it's out there and it's happening everywhere um, mm -hmm. still. So if, if you've done a set of spelling words, part of your retrieval homework might be the words, the big ones that they really need that they probably will write a lot on their own, um, those should appear in a retrieval-based homework that, that comes up, that loops back through. So the same thing with math skills, retrieval practice is huge in math because kids are really good at, let's say your work, you've finished, you've mastered addition, you're working on subtraction with students 
um, when they're in the subtraction unit and all you're doing in class is subtraction, they know every problem they're doing deals with subtraction and their brain has to naturally know to solve the problem with subtraction. But we get really frustrated when we try to return to a higher level step of addition, perhaps a word problem that requires addition and then subtraction. We get frustrated with students when we say, but you mastered addition, why can't you do it now? Well, the reality is, is that they don't know to apply addition to that scenario. And so what we have to do is, because they're not working in it. So what we have to do is make sure that we're providing that retrieval practice where they are being exposed to skill sets that they've previously learned that they're not currently doing to really um, hone in and, and solidify that skill in their brain. So can they pull that skill out at random times? That's what it feels like, random times retrieval practice. Um, where we don't have the, oh, I'm doing this in school, so this must be how I solve this problem. And so that, so retrieval practice can have some, some benefits in, in homework, and you can guarantee that they've, you, if you send it home and you, they've, they've um, mastered it in, in a previous unit, then you know it's safe to send home. Right, because it's part of your purpose where they're, you know, it's repetition of what they've already been yeah. able to do. And then the last one is my absolute favorite, um, and it's my, my biggest recommended ones when I work with teachers, and that's reflection-based homework. One of the best things that you can do for kids if you're, if you're giving them homework is to make it a reflection of what they've learned. And so, meaning you give them homework that is, um, as we said, the antacid. Um, so it is the Tums of their learning that day. And so it prompts them with different questions on how to digest and chunk out their learning. Um, and so this could be, maybe we, I'm gonna stay with math again, you know, we're working on solving word problems with subtraction and addition. And the teacher's done and they've practiced in class several word problems. The student doesn't go home and do another word problem. What they do is they pick one of the ones that they did together as a class or one of the ones that the teacher modeled, and they have to write a narration of what did, the, what did we do at each step. So the problem solved, the teacher has walked them through how, how to solve it, but now can they actually communicate what those steps are to solving that problem? Once students can communicate either in speaking or writing a process, then they've solidified that process because they've had to compose the steps themselves. Um, so for home, just reflection, like how, let's say we'd learned something really new in science. Um, you know, how strong do you feel about this, about your learning this concept? And for younger kids, it's coloring in an emoji face, right? Which, which one matches how you feel about photosynthesis? Um, and then, okay, what piece of it, why do you feel that way? Um, so I think those are, those are the pieces that can really aid in the digestion of learning rather than giving them um, more of the same thing. Let's sit and process what we've done. And we yeah, I think a lot of teachers are like, well, I don't give a lot of homework and I only give like a few problems and it's like, ugh, but it's still not falling into these really, like, you could be doing it a little bit stronger, like you could be doing it with retrieval or reflection or play-based or like it, those problems that you thought you, you were just giving a few really aren't maybe falling into those categories and it's not solidifying the learning as well. Like just like make homework, if you're going to give it, make it work for better for you and the kids. Um, I think is kind of our point. Um, I know I don't, I look at my daughter's math and um, I look at what she needs to do on a worksheet and then we don't do it until the day before it's due. What I end up doing is I end up making play-based tactile things for her Monday through Wednesday based on the Thursday's homework because I know in order for her to like just based on how she learns, she needs to do some moving of parts or putting something on a number line or uh, even just like using like like toy cars for my son to, to do something with before. And then if I can see that she's kind of got it down from there, then when I let her go on the worksheet on her own, she's totally great. But if I would have just had her do that on her own, her processing probably wouldn't stick. 
Um, and again, it's a worksheet that they just did that, that that's what they're working on this week. There's not a whole lot of retrieval in it. So I think when we talk about homework, where we really, really want to make sure that A passes Julia's test, the PASS criteria, but then once you do get through that test, that criteria, then you need to look at what type is it. Is it play-based? Is it retrieval-based? Or is it reflection-based? Um, and that's going to save teachers a lot of time, too, on grading homework. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if we are really um, specific about the types of homework that we're sending home, the feedback, and, and this is important because the students are going to be giving us feedback about their learning. That's really what homework should be. Homework should be some type of mm -hmm. feedback from the kids that shows you really from their perspective what they think they can do. And so I think if we're really specific about the types of things we send home, what comes back into the classroom becomes something for us that's much more valuable and worth our time rather than just grading that worksheet together when we come back. Yeah, or just even not even grading it. Like sometimes they come home and it's just like a check or a smiley face. And my daughter's like, I don't even know. And then I'll look at it and like three things will be wrong. And I'm like, ah, like, why are we doing that then? So there's just, as a parent, you know, I think this is why this has come up and this is why we've made this class is it was just getting frustrating for us as teacher parents. Teacher, teacher momming is hard. Yeah, um, it's very hard. We have, we have a hard time. <laughs> So, okay, some teachers may be listening to this and thinking, this sounds great. I actually really like all these ideas, but I'm going to get pushed back from parents. I'm going to get pushed back from my principal. I'm going to get pushed back from my PLC or my team. Uh, we've heard over and over again that students need to do homework and learn, and they need to learn it. About, they don't actually need to learn the homework. They need to learn responsibility and time management, or they need to practice the skills being taught. How are they going to practice if they don't have homework? So there's all these pushbacks that we hear during the class that we teach, but also when we're out on campuses. Um, what would be your response to all that pushback for those teachers that are in those positions? Well, I think first thing that as teachers, we need to recognize that when parents are upset with us about something we're doing, um, it's most likely because we have not been proactively communicating with them. Um, all too often, we tend to wait until parents start emailing us about things they're frustrated with before we respond. And I think if we would just be proactive, so let's say you have designed a year of homework that's going to look really different than what they've had in your school up until that point. The first thing you need to do is you make sure that open house night, you give parents the why you're going to change homework up this year and what it's going to look like and what they can do if they want more practice for their students. And I think if we would just communicate with parents, that would solve probably 99% of our issues. There's always gonna be an outlier, but really parents just wanna know what you're doing and why you're doing it. So if we can just give the why, most of our parents will get on board with us. So we just need to be proactive. In response to the, like it teaches them responsibility um, pushback, that they need to learn time management and responsibility. We need to look at our own lives as adults, right? We are responsible for our work when we are at work, and we are responsible yeah. for our home when we're at home. And we get very upset, and it becomes difficult when our work life crosses into our home life. I'll be honest with you, if I have a project that I need to complete at home, it completely throws off the time management of my evening and the things that I'm responsible for at home in the evening. And so we get it becomes chaotic. So I think we need to recognize that um, yes, we need to teach kids responsibility and time management in a school-based environment, but then the home environment is where they should be learning responsibility and time management of the home environment. When we start crossing school into that environment, it gets chaotic and things get difficult. So yes, absolutely, time management and responsibility, big, but it needs to be relevant to where they're at at different times of the day. And that final thing is, um, you know, teachers say we need to have them practice the skills being taught. Um, yeah, it's correct. Students need to practice skills, um, but not the new ones. Not the new ones. If we have them practice incorrectly, we are going to lose precious class time because they've learned bad habits that we now have to fix. And so this goes back to, yes, practice is important, but let's make it purposeful and let's use retrieval practice where they're practicing okay. things that they've already mastered just so they're getting repetition and, and it, like that concrete um, component of those skills. So 
So I think we just, we have to jump in and try, try things out, but we just need to communicate with parents um, and we need to really be purposeful about what we're choosing and why. Yeah. And I love the, how much time it's going to take. Um, you know, for the younger ones, I hate watching her push her brother away who wants to play with her because she is having to do write her spelling words five times across the page. It's like, I just, I don't know. There's those moments as a parent where you're like, they haven't seen each other all day and for siblings to want to play together is an anomaly in itself. And so I would like that to happen. And so sometimes I just say, Hey, forget about that for right now. Let's do that. Um, at a different time, we'll play with your brother because to me, that's really, I mean, that relationship and them building that relationship to me right now is more important than if you can spell this combobulated. Right. And I think even as, so. um, you know, from the, the parent perspective too, of I get home with the kids and it's usually me home with the kids for a couple of hours before my husband's home from work. And I have to cook dinner during that time. But the time that I'm not busy cooking dinner, I find myself having to help. Uh, my daughter with her homework uh, and more often than I can actually give attention to my three-year-old and so then he gets really upset because all he wants is some of mom's attention too but mom's attention is focused on helping sister like map out and and do do homework so um, I think it also from a parent perspective it makes that it like you're I'm now being told what time how I'm supposed to allocate my time with my kids right I mean, that's hard that you just, you just want them to come home and be home. I think mo most of the time and we're both educators and we greatly value education. So it's not that we don't want our kids continuing to learn. Um, but we just want them to also have the opportunity to learn things that aren't school-based. Yeah. Yep. And then grow and, and make mistakes also that are just play-based mistakes or social norms like we want to be able to take them to the park or you know all those types of things and, and we don't have time to do that when they are saddled with a, a good amount of homework. yeah you know so, i think even even cooking right? dinner like we there, there's always that joke right in college that you know you're eating mac and cheese and ramen noodles because a that's all you can afford and b but you don't know how to cook anything else right you can only boil water yeah well we have to think about why that is well my daughter's usually always doing homework while I'm cooking dinner. So there's not a lot of opportunity. And I would imagine it's like in other households. There's not a lot of opportunity as she's getting older now for me to pull her in to have her help so that she learns some of those skills. Like there's some survival skills, like being able to make your own food. Yeah, we would not have a freshman 15 if we didn't have so much. <laughs> like, so I think there's just, there's more than just school. And they need time to engage in the world that exists outside of school. Yeah, we're definitely on the same page as that. And we are very passionate educators. So um, we're not saying no homework. Um, I don't think that's the point, but we definitely are saying, um, make sure you have the past criteria, um, the purpose, the amount of time, um, kind of the, the space that they're in, right? And what was your, the other one was um, the support. Yeah. And then also just kind of make sure it's in a good category um, that they can do on their own. So whether it's play-based, retrieval practice, or reflection. Okay. All right. This has been a great conversation. I have so enjoyed talking to you about this because obviously this is a passion of both of ours. Um, but now it's time for rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Oh my goodness. Uh, I think so. You know, I'm a planner, so I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it. <laughs> This is my like little fun thing you get to do at the end, which I, I always enjoy. Okay, so here's your first one. Education is um, hard. Yeah, education oh is God. hard. There's there's so many dynamics to consider, and if you've never taught, it's really hard to articulate why it's so hard. And it's just the dynamic that it changes on a daily basis, and it's hard I to put words to. I think it's also hard because everyone has been a student. And so I think parents don't realize how much education has changed since they were a student. Um, and so I think education is also hard that way where they're like, well, wait, you know, the things as things change, 
all they can remember is when they were a student and things are taught so differently now. Um, so I think it's just hard for everyone involved. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What inspires you? Oh, that's easy. My faith. Oh, very good. Okay. If you could pass on any wisdom to students, what would you share? So, oh boy, let me think on that one. So I think really what I would share with students is I think that they all need to know, and I think as teachers, we need to accept and share this with them, that school and the world of school is not a mirror of their future adult lives. I think I love that. I think it's so helpful for kids to understand, like, you know, and, and rightfully so, and in all good intentions, we cultivate in students this idea that school is the only way that they can find success. And by all means, school is an indicator of future success up to a point, um, but it's not the only indicator. You know, I believe that education is this great equalizer, but I think when handled poorly, it can also cause inequity and self-doubt, right? If a child doesn't fit into whatever the mold is of the classroom that they're learning in, um, they they can start to doubt themselves and they can lose that, that sense of self. And so I think just really trying to recognize that they're, they're, that school is really important, but there's also a world outside of school that can teach us things in different ways. And though that's, that's also really important. Well, that's really good wisdom. I need that wisdom. Um, okay. <laughs> what are your must have smartphone apps? Um, Pinterest. It's all about you couldn't it. Live without it. Yeah, I'm I'm such a visual person that mm -hmm. I I've learned so much. Like my mom taught me how to crochet, but just kind of looking at different projects on Pinterest, I've been able to to learn new um, new things to make or new stitches or things to do, and it's kind of fun because then I actually go and teach my mom how to do some of the new. Yeah. Ones. Um, so yeah, Pinterest has, and I, I I use it a lot to gather ideas in the creative process. So. The pictures spark for me. Um, it, like I saw, I saw a bookshelf um, one morning right before I had to do a training, and I thought, oh my gosh, we could do bookshelf notes. They could add titles of books to a bookshelf that represents their learning for that day. And so, I, the imagery of Pinterest inspires me. I love that. Yep, totally. I, and I'm visual too, so I see something and it sparks something else in my head, and things start to go. Okay, last rapid fire question. What song do you know all the lyrics to? Uh, that's an easy one right now. It probably changes um, depending on what I'm really interested in. Um, beyond every Christmas song. That oh, exists, yeah. <laughs> um, would be the Skylar Sisters from um, Hamilton. Yes, we love Hamilton in our office. It's so fun. Okay, thank you. You did good on those. You were nervous, but you did good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... If listeners want to learn more from you, where can they find you in the online space? Um, so they can um, always email. I, I've emailed. They can reach me, which is, um, I think you'll include in the, the notes. Uh -huh. They can also fo just follow us, which is our, our department, uh, on Instagram or on Facebook. And so those are, those are really the environments right now. Um, in the future, I hope to maybe have a blog or, or other things that I can share. It's just still in the works right now. So yeah, I really well, email. Well, that's time you have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to decide between crocheting and building a blog. Um, and right now, crocheting is winning. So I think um, that's fine because building a blog would almost be like taking your work home, and we just talked about that. Yeah, it's so true, and that's probably why I opt for the crocheting every time. Yeah, that's probably why you opted, yep, um, because that's definitely a creative, and you still are probably thinking about and digesting your work through your crocheting, but it's a great expression of um, how you can digest things is, is yeah, through absolutely. The, that creative expression. Okay, yep, so that was awesome. Thanks for coming on and talking about homework, um, and I will have you definitely on next season. Um, but I do appreciate you, you taking the time to kind of go through all that because I feel like this is such an important topic for teachers. Yeah, thank you for having me. I agree. This is this is important for us to discuss and kind of figure out what is best for kids and what does that look like um, in today's world. So thanks for having me on. This was fun, as always. Thanks for a lot. And I will um, definitely link everything for the show notes for um, our listeners so they can get um, – 
some of maybe a piece of our homework class for free. Maybe they can get a download um, when they go to the show notes. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. Well, have a good one. Okay, you too. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Learning Unlocked and finding out more about homework and our criteria for homework that we have come up with in our department. The PASS criteria, P-A-S-S, as well as retrieval practice, play-based practice, and also reflection practice homework. If you've listened today as a GPS educator, you can receive PD recertification credit by visiting our employee hub page and navigating to professional growth and then digital PD courses. Just a reminder that we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GPS Prof Growth. That's at GPS P-R-O-F G-R-O-W-T-H. For more information or resources from this episode, please visit our website at learningunlocked.lipson.com forward slash website. We are distributing